Among the most famous of all the religious festivals of antiquity, the Eleusinia was held in honor of Demeter and her daughter Persephone. The festival's name derives from a small but influential town in Attica, approximately 21 kilometers northwest of Athens, Eleusis. For centuries, the mystery rites performed exclusively on site at Eleusis had tremendous influence on the religious landscape of both Greek and Roman worlds. Clement of Alexandria, among the most authoritative of the festival's critics, referred to the Eleusinian mysteries as a mystical drama. Akin to all other known mystery cults, the rituals undertaken were a sort of reconstructive drama in which the passions of Kore and Demeter could be experienced firsthand by initiates. The mysteries focused on these two goddesses due to their ties to agricultural fertility. Both goddesses were considered personifications of grain, uh, Kore as the freshly sown grain of autumn, and Demeter as the mature grain with maternal potential. Prior to Athens's annexation of Eleusis, the mysteries of Demeter and Kore were conducted by an independent community, and the Homeric hymn to Demeter presupposes such a state of affairs. Once Athens had assumed jurisdiction of the mysteries around the year 600 BC, Athenian interests naturally came to predominate in the celebration of the Eleusinian mysteries. This Homeric hymn to Demeter is believed to be a crucial source in recreating the elusive drama. But like all historical artifacts, this particular source gives only a part of the story, a part which happens to be embellished and convoluted in poetic conventions. Religious scholars, then, must supplement the Homeric hymn with a variety of other sources in order to paint a fuller picture of what may exactly have happened at the festival. Today, I want to give somewhat of a reconstruction of what may have happened during the festival nights, I want to talk about the problems that arise in the recreation of these mysterious events, and uh, the reasons for their widespread popularity in the Greco-Roman world. So, early scholars of Roman religion, statesmen of the Republic alike, have regarded the Roman citizenry's participation in foreign cults in an unwaveringly depreciatory light. By and large, religious novelties were seen to have tainted an originally wholesome Roman state religion. In spite of this, cult festivals like the Eleusinian Mysteries continued to gain mass appeal well into the Roman imperial period as the empire's influence diffused throughout the entire Mediterranean world. One question arises from this phenomenon. Since, from a religious point of view, Greece had been relatively homogenous, why had Rome differed so dramatically? What political, socio-cultural, and spiritual revolutions from the 4th century BC onward had pried open that floodgate for foreign religious influence in the form of mystery cults? If we come at this popularity of foreign cults as a natural reaction to the rise of Hellenism and its marriage of the Eastern and Western worlds, coupled with the moral bankruptcy of the Roman state religion, the rise of individualism, and the rampancy of superstition, the appeal of foreign cults may appear as anything but a cultural anomaly. Despite all the scholarship over the past two centuries devoted to the study of the mystery religions, scholars continue to encounter lots of difficulties in conveying a simple yet sufficient idea to the modern mind of what these cults actually entailed. The very nature of the mystery rites demanded such a degree of secrecy that any sort of familiarity with either the history or practices has been both fragmentary and speculative at best. Whereas early Christians had been encouraged to proselytize, making scholarship on such a group far easier, the remainder of the more enigmatic mystery cults, including the Eleusinian mysteries, left us substantially fewer footprints. 
Although nobody forbade initiates from praising the blessedness or the beatific vision they got during their initiation, it was far more common for people to divulge the ideas and philosophical teachings which the cults shared rather than details concerning rituals and practices, as some works of Cicero, Plutarch, Porphyry, Julian, and Proclus have demonstrated. Oaths of secrecy were well kept, and uh, the mysteries which ancient authors refused to reveal have never been solved. It is not lawful to mention the orgies which Demeter established, reads the Homeric hymn. We're told that Aeschylus was charged by a mob for nearly having exposed the secrets of the Eleusinian rites, and that an inebriated Alcibiades was sent into exile for blasphemy against the Eleusinian hierophant, among plenty of other offenses. As a result of such obstacles, Samuel Angus said that scholars concerned with mysteries are in a much worse position in regard to these ancient cults than a present-day historian would be in regard to Freemasonry. He says, A mason may not disclose the secrets, while an outsider could record only such usages of Freemasonry as are openly spoken of by the Brotherhood. The bulk of information used in unveiling mysteries comes down from antiquity in several forms of scattered references. Lines of poetry, hymns or prayers, eroded inscriptions, cult symbols, vase shards, vandalized sanctuaries, and enigmatic frescoes, all of which tend to beget more questions than to provide concrete answers. Despite the tremendous logistical issues surrounding the study of the mysteries, the topic has now captured the attention of religious scholars, historians, occultists, magicians, and even New Agers for well over the past two centuries. A quick glance at mystery cult historiography proves that such a field of study has been subject of virulent debate despite the lack of any robust statistical or literary evidence. In any case, as archaeological evidence continues to be unearthed and dated works are revised in light of new discoveries, the study of mystery cults will persist and diminish in speculatory nature. So, before turning to the history behind the rise of a religious phenomenon as seemingly peculiar as that of the Festival of Eleusis, a universal definition of the mysteries is in order. The mystery rites were the experience of an amalgamation of symbolic acts. Let me say that again. The experience of an amalgamation of symbolic acts. These symbolic acts, or symbols in general, took their form in liturgy, ritual, icons, sacraments, myths, and allegories. These were then divided into three distinct categories. The legomena, the things said, the decnumena, the things shown, and the dromena, the things done. Again, let me repeat that, because this is a really important concept to get in the study of mystery cults. The legomena, the things said, the decnumena, the things shown, and the dromena, the things done. These kinds of symbols were then pooled into one event, the mystery, and then undertaken by initiates, probably under the effect of an ergotized rye-derived hallucinogen. The powerful and bizarre experiences were designed to be conducive to physical ecstasy and subsequently spiritual catharsis. Through such catharsis, initiates identified themselves with a particular deity, they believed themselves to be reborn or purged from sin, and finally, they were unified with a transcendental divine realm. The gift of the goddess, however, wasn't merely a spiritual one. Demeter was the giver of grain, so in the most fundamental sense possible, the giver of riches, of Plutos. The maintenance of the Eleusinian mysteries had a perceived practical effect, too. 
guaranteeing an annual supply of grain. Most mystery cults evolved out of a variety of simple agrarian festivals, which celebrated the death and rebirth of crops, so deities commonly revered by mysteries like uh, Osiris, Zagreus, Attis, Adonis, and in this particular case, Demeter and Cory, they've all long been considered to be anthropomorphic embodiments of natural cycles, that is, the death and rebirth inherent to nature. Devotees of these gods sought to symbolically reenact their deity's passion through the mysteries themselves in hope that they might also conquer the grave, though what exactly occurred during these mysteries remains mostly hidden. Some believe healing miracles were playing a big role at Eleusis. Walter Burkert writes of a man who was miraculously cured of his blindness in order that he might quote-unquote behold the sacred exhibition. To me, however, this only proves that the sacred exhibitions dished out at Eleusis weren't the kind beheld with the physical eye, but with an inner eye. The Eleusinian festival was divided into two separate celebrations, the Greater Eleusinia of Autumn, in which the Catabasis occurred, and the Lesser Eleusinia of Spring, celebrated on the Agri on the banks of the Eleusis. The Lesser Mysteries were a prelude to the Greater, and were presented on a much smaller scale, but initiation in the lesser was required before initiates could bear the title of Mustai and move on toward the greater mysteries. According to some accounts, the lesser mysteries had pertained specifically to Kore and Dionysus, while the greater were set aside for the passions of Demeter and her daughter. The lesser mysteries at Agra probably consisted of purification rituals from which the waters of the Elysis would have been used. It appears as though the rapture of Cori was the central focus of these specific rites. Six months after the lesser mysteries took place on the 14th day of Boedromion, or our September, the nine-day celebration of the greater mysteries began. On the opening day of the festivities, sacred symbols were carried out from Eleusis to Athens, and the Hierophant of Eleusis would read the proclamation, which marked the beginning of the Telete, or the initiation. The proclamation declared that, and I quote, Everyone who has clean hands and intelligible speech, who is pure from all pollution, and whose soul is conscious of no evil, and who has lived well and justly, was permitted to proceed into the mysteries. Foreigners were accepted into the lesser mysteries, but not into the greater. These regulations were done to commemorate the mythical initiation of Heracles, who was a foreigner himself and who, according to primitive custom, couldn't be initiated into the mysteries, because he didn't speak Greek. On the 16th day of the month, a crowd of initiates traveled to bathe in the sea at Phaleron in an act of ritual purification. The next day, sacrifices were made at a temple called the Eleusinion, followed by a day of rest. On the 19th day of Boedromion, initiates crowned in wreaths and carrying great torches were led by priests of Eleusis from Athens by means of the sacred way. The fasted 30-kilometer journey through the countryside was filled with song and merriment. Since initiates left Athens just before noon, the sanctuary at Eleusis wasn't reached until midnight, especially due to the numerous stops before designated altars, shrines, and sanctuaries lining the sacred way. The mystery rites themselves took place on the 20th and the 21st of the month in the Telestrion building, which would have been capable of hosting several thousand initiates at once. What was said, shown, and done during those festival nights at Eleusis is not clear. The oath of secrecy was well kept, and the mystery has never been truly solved from what ancient authors agreed to divulge. 
Personally, I don't believe the mysteries will ever be solved, since there's something which can't be conveyed by a script or a small mouth noises. It was an event based on a structured madness, designed to provoke ecstatic experiences, full of indescribable hallucinations. Archaeological evidence shows that on either side of the Telestrion were rows of seats from which initiates watched the mysteries unfold. In the center of the hall was located a monolithic stone construct called the Anactaron. Uh, inside of it were kept secret objects or maybe even substances sacred to Demeter. Only the Hierophants could enter the Anactaron and from it they performed the rites and displayed the sacred objects like a Catholic priest does at High Mass. Concerning the greater mysteries, there appears to have been, at the very least, two degrees of initiation, with at least one year between them. There's no doubt that a succession of rites and revelations leading step by step toward an ideal of religious perfection existed. Those fully initiated were dubbed overseers, and these were the people eligible for attaining Epoptea, the Hierophant's greatest mystery. The following day, initiates poured out libations from special vases in honor of the dead, and at last, on the 23rd of the month, the celebrations came to a close. It may be safely assumed that the pageant of Demeter's wanderings the abduction of Cory and the reunion of the mother and daughter formed the main part of the Dromena. These would have occurred as symbolic dramas or passion plays in which the troubles of the goddess would be reenacted, making initiates take part in her suffering, share with her the misery, and in stark contrast, the joy of her daughter's return. The Christian author Lactantius writes, With burning torches Proserpina is sought, and when she is found the rite is closed with general thanksgiving and waving of torches. It's pretty commonly agreed upon that the drama of Demeter and Cory symbolized a spiritual death and rebirth. It gave initiates confidence to face a world in which death was omnipresent. Beyond this point, few agree on anything. Whether or not the Dromena were just a ritual drama, we can't be certain. The Kukeon, the sacramental elixir of Demeter, along with a communal meal, may very well have been included into the Dromena, but what the Deknumenae and the Legomena were, uh, scholars are in little position to know. Uh, nobody wants to talk about things said or things shown, since these transcended any form of written word or material evidence. Historians can only do their work when these sources are available. The things said may have been a mere invitation to eat and drink the first fruits of the harvest. Clement of Alexandria wrote how initiates would declare, I fasted, I drank the Kukeon, I took from the chest, I put back into the basket, and from the basket into the chest. The Kukeon was possibly a fermented barley drink flavored with mint, but it's even more likely that whatever grain it was made from, it had been contaminated with the fungus Claviceps purpurea, and that contains powerful LSD-like ergot alkaloids with strong hallucinogenic properties. There's little evidence to support that there were any creeds which one had to repeat and accept, a detail which may help to illustrate the universality and undogmatic nature of pre-Christian cults. The things shown may have included any number of sacred relics or symbols embodying the regenerative forces of nature, such as a wooden phallus or an ear of corn. Among the ritual objects found in the ruins of the Eleusinian temple grounds were included images of wheat or barley, uh, pomegranates, which was Persephone's fatal meal, poppies, a symbol of sleep and death, and also intoxication, and the snake, which symbolized death and rebirth because of the perennial shedding of its skin. 
As mentioned before, most information about the mysteries remains highly speculative. Whether the event faded in an initiate's memory over time or led to a dramatic lifestyle change depended entirely on that individual's disposition. In the Phaedo, Plato claimed that although many had borne the Thyrsus rod, few had truly become mystae. The Eleusinian mysteries, however, are but a single example drawn from among countless other mysteries and cult festivals practiced throughout the Roman Empire. When discussing the popularity of festivals such as those at Eleusis, it's hard to disentangle the causes of their popularization from their effects on the wider Mediterranean world. The international popularization of the Eleusinia was a historical event like any other, for which causes are numerous and complex. Franz Cumont, the Belgian scholar of mystery cults, gives an account for the superiority of mystery cults in that they gave greater satisfaction to the senses and emotions, to the intelligence and chiefly to conscience, and, and I quote, compared with the ancient creeds, they appear to have offered greater beauty of ritual, greater truth of doctrine, and a far superior morality. In any case, such a simplistic answer can't account for why the Eleusinian festival was ubiquitously held in such high esteem by the ancient world. Widespread Eleusinian propaganda could be found in both literature and iconography, extending as far as even Russia and Egypt by the 4th century BC. The festival is likely to have achieved this sort of international recognition insofar as it was flexible to the religious sensibilities of the individual. No characteristic of the Greco-Roman world was more vital to its religious history than the rise of individualism. Unlike political regimes, city-states, philosophical and social movements, the individual could endure through any historical calamity or revolution. Prior to Alexander's introduction of cosmopolitanism, the universal understanding of ancient social life was that individuals were the cogs in the machinery of a particular state, clan, or family, rather than members of humanity as a whole. The lowest common denominator had been that of corporate bodies, not of individuals. While such a mentality proved to be excellent in the maintenance of systems like the Greek polis, it couldn't survive alongside the consciousness of universalism bred by the world empires. In the East, social bonds of cohesion had always been made up from the top down through authoritarian systems of government, and as such, they'd never truly formed an understanding of quote-unquote freedom and self-government in the modern Western sense of the word. As a result of this, societies developed individual importance in religions divorced from national concerns. As the sophists began professing the notion of relativism in Greece, and as Rome moved towards Eastern societal models, the perceptions concerning the individual vis-a-vis -vis the community dramatically changed. The Roman Revolution itself could even be summarized as a series of conflicts between the status quo and individuals' ambitions. Violent political factionalism, uh, numerous dictatorships, civil wars, the vying for prestigious offices, and of course, the expanding interest in the deeply personal mystery cults. Coupled with the rise of individuality was an outbreak of superstition which had overwhelmingly taken hold of Greek and Roman lives. Since the sanctity of state religions had decayed, individualistic tendencies towards superstition were given freer play. The rise of superstitio, which had developed as a species of nonconformity against the public religio, was a symptom of the age. Men and women of the ancient world, rich or poor, 
had certainly not ceased to believe in the supernatural or the divine whose powers intermingled with their own lives. Kumau holds that, quote, people would no longer take a bath, go to the barber, change their clothes, or manicure their fingernails without first awaiting the propitious moment. Since public auguries and auspices were gradually relegated to oblivion, new methods of divination were developed for this era of uncertainty, especially following contact with the East. More occult manifestations of superstition, such as necromancy, demonology, and witchcraft, weren't only considered dangerous, but also came to symbolize political subversiveness. The literature of Rome including that of Cicero, Lucretius, Seneca, and Lucian, is teeming with sneering remarks against the infectious superstition of their age. In his essay on superstition, Plutarch describes it as a moral and emotional disorder motivated by fear, as comparable with atheism, which is an intellectual error. And I quote, No disease is so full of variations, so mutable in symptoms, as is the disease called superstition. We must therefore fly from it, but in a safe way. Some people, when running away from superstition, fall headlong into atheism and leap over that which lies between the two, namely, true religion. The ominous presence of superstition left men and women with little respite, and subsequently they could either turn to expensive and fraudulent fortune-tellers, and astrologers, and mystic charlatans, or accept the allure of the exotic mysteries such as those at Eleusis, which were now open to all Greek-speaking foreigners. The Eleusinia was comprehensive, enlightening, self-gratifying, and both spiritually and socially stimulating. It could alleviate the crushing weight of superstition and societal oppression while appealing to a wide range of individual sensibilities and filling the void of dry, unrewarding state religions. In the era leading up to the Hellenistic Age, the Greek polis had proven its worth in promoting the creative spirit of their citizenry. Such small, homogeneous, and ideological parochial states that lay strewn about the mountains, hills, and islands of Magna Graecia, and over centuries, each of these insular communities developed their own sets of social, cultural, political, and religious virtues. With the conquests of Alexander between 336 and 323 BC, came profound changes to the old polis and its traditional ties to the old Greek pantheon. As the Macedonian conqueror battled his way through Central Asia as far as present-day Afghanistan and to the Indus River, he yoked numerous cities, old and new, establishing a new network of municipalities which would prove fundamental as springboards for the realization of his future ecumenical interests. This process was also greatly facilitated by Alexander's introduction of Koine Greek, which proved crucial in the synergistic growth of each particular mystery religion through the elimination of linguistic and intellectual barriers. Since the Eleusinian mysteries had expanded in the 6th century BC to become a Pan-Hellenic festival under Pisistratus, Pilgrims flocked from the furthest corners of Magna Graecia to participate. As tradition dictated, only murderers and barbaroi, people who can't speak Greek, could be exempt from initiation. Following Alexander's conquest, however, Koine Greek had become the international language of the Mediterranean, and the quantity of Greek-speaking individuals expanded exponentially. Emerging from the marriage of East and West came a new understanding in the Greek mind, that of an inhabited world, the Ecumene. The world could no longer be seen as comprised of sparse pockets of Greeks amidst an ocean of uncivilized barbarians, but rather as a cosmos rich in material and ideological wealth. Although it hadn't reached its zenith until A.D. 3rd or 4th centuries, 
The impact of religious syncretism rocked both Greece and Rome immediately following both Alexander and Pompey's conquests in the East. Without exception, all mystery religions which reached Greek and Italian shores were profoundly affected by syncretism. Through the medium of the new lingua franca, koine, the widespread demand for personal gods, and the considerable decrease in religious and ethnic intolerance, the transition towards syncretism appears to have come about as a natural cultural change. Alexander himself, who founded a temple of Isis along one devoted to the Olympians in Alexandria, promoted this novel understanding of the spiritual realm. Alexandria was the birthplace of Serapis, which was really a manifestation of the syncretic spirit, since it was basically, a, as a deity, a collation of Egyptian gods, Osiris, Apis, and Ra, with the Greek Zeus, Helios, and Asclepius. The intensity of syncretism increased substantially under the Roman Empire, whose successes necessitated the harmony of a world religion, even if such a religion was merely a tapestry of inextricably linked cults, faith, and philosophies such as Stoicism, Epicureanism, Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, Pythagoreanism, and so forth. Syncretism was the inevitable result of decaying city-states, the rise of the individual, and cosmopolitanism. National faiths and philosophies no longer appealed to the novel, exotic sensibilities of the world united by Alexander and later by Roman law, roads, and government. Society under the early empire continued to be as highly Hellenized as it had been during the three centuries previous. Greek continued to be the language of culture and commerce, with Latin as the lingua franca of diplomacy. The sea, cleared of pirates, was a great channel of commerce that led to all the Roman world, and the military highways provided the necessary land routes. Because of the easy means of communication, there was a free mingling of races and classes in the centers of population. Three centuries' worth of military campaigns had essentially linked the Eastern and Western worlds and given them a potent impetus toward universal syncretism by breaking up, to use an anachronistic term, the nationalities of men and gods. No ancient religious system could maintain its purity in competition for new converts, and as such, the necessity for mutual exchange of ideas was conducive to the unanimity of all faith systems. Every major Mediterranean urban center was witness to the intermingling of Roman soldiers with native peoples, Thracian slaves with Greek scholars, and Egyptian merchants with Tyrian sailors, all preoccupied in a common struggle for existence under the jurisdiction of one huge empire. Rejections of syncretism as attempts toward religio-cultural preservation, as practiced by Jews and later the Christians, led to widespread cultural ostracism and perception of backwardness for those who professed that their gods were untouched by cultural exchange. As doubts came to shadow over the traditional Greek understanding of nature, outdated notions of religion also underwent rigorous scrutiny. Although a handful of famous philosophers and playwrights had questioned the existence of old gods long before Alexander, such curiosities weren't the norm. Throughout the Hellenistic period, the Olympians began to fall from all their positions of spiritual importance in Greece, although they maintained their importance as cultural symbols and continued to receive state recognition for centuries to come. Indeed, the Olympians remained both the inspiration and the subject for the greatest festivals, works of literature, and pieces of artwork. But since their destinies, as Marvin Meyer states, were linked to those of the Greek polis, which was no longer the basic political unit in the world after Alexander's time, 
the philosophical criticism of religion challenged Greek beliefs and exposed the gods as unworthy of worship. In this spiritual vacuum, the Greeks searched abroad for experiences which could satisfy the spiritual needs of an age as revolutionary as Alexander's. But thanks to the Eleusinia, they needn't look far. It was simply spiritual needs which resulted in the widespread explosion of popularity for the mystery cults and festivals. The disintegration of the city-state system was a chronologically uneven process throughout the Mediterranean world. This collapse was completed in Greece with the rise of Alexander, but in Rome it ended with the Second Punic War. If the unification of the Occident with the Orient had been inaugurated through Alexander's conquests, then Rome may be said to have consummated such a relationship. The Roman Empire had broken down the ethnic, cultural, and linguistic barriers which had divided the world, but contrary to expectations, the flow of religious and intellectual innovation would run from east to west. Rome became involved in vigorous military contact with the Greek world in 281 BC and onwards, and within little more than a century, the whole of that world yielded to Roman hegemony. Roman religion had traditionally been that of a practical and patriotic people, fostering domestic and civic virtues, continuously being elaborated by foreign accretions. It was essentially a family religion. And just as the Greek religion was strengthened by its ties to the political life, so too was the animistic Roman religion. Due to such an intricate connection, however, Roman religion was ultimately disintegrated into the political machinery of the Senate, leaving the common people in a state of spiritual dissatisfaction. With a wedded palate for foreign cults following the Hannibalic Wars and the arrival of the Great Mother in 205 BC, Rome's traditional religion proved ineffective in meeting the spiritual needs of its people, and it began its steady decline. Buried beneath the uncertainties of war, the lust for conquest and wealth, the decadence brought on by the Punic curse, and the gradual acceptance of Greek skepticism, traditional piety was suffocated. Civic concerns won out against religious ones, and the gulf between popular piety and political ambition widened as state religion collapsed into a dry and ceremonial me mechanism of control for the educated nobility. By the late Republic, Roman religion had been reduced to an assortment of unintelligible ceremonies and rituals meticulously and mechanically reproduced with little alteration from the ancient formulas hallowed as the Mos Maiorum, the tradition of the ancestors. The men assigned to its organization recognized it as a tool over the people, but they had no faith in their own practices. Even Cicero, in his De Divinatione, accounts for Cato's bewilderment concerning a specific state cult office. He says, That was quite a remark which Cato made many years ago. I'm amazed that one Horuspex doesn't laugh upon seeing another. As the mass is turned away from public divinations, the civic auguriae and auspices fell into disuse, and by the time of Augustus's Pax Romana, the state had consciously abandoned its spiritual origins. Livy himself lamented such a break from the ways of his ancestors, as he wrote, Who is unaware that this city was founded only after taking the divinations, and that everything in war and peace, at home and abroad, was done only after taking divinations? As a state-run rights lost their appeal, Many educated Romans set their eyes on Greek shores to satisfy new spiritual yearnings. Unlike the religions of the state, the cults were enigmatic groups composed of self-willing devotees. One couldn't be born into the mysteries. The mysteries were sustained by an introverted 
and private form of personal worship as opposed to the common outward signs of allegiance to the civic gods. In a world in which religion and the state were inextricably bound up, such a change of perception concerning religious matters may have seemed baffling. Between the time of Alexander and Augustine, the Eleusinian mysteries harmoniously coexisted alongside the state cults and even received support through official state patronage. Quote, the interrelations between private initiations and official festivals are complicated and far from uniform. Mystery initiations were an optional activity within the polytheistic religion comparable to, say, a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela within the Christian system, wrote Walter Burkert. The Eleusinia differed from the rituals prescribed by the state since they called for an element of personal choice. Initiation was not unavoidably prearranged by ancestral or political adherents. Though it's true that there were initiations of children in some mystery cults, like the Mysteries of Dionysus, more frequently, the, this was just a special honor or dedication by concerned parents rather than the religious duty. Even so, with Theodosius's imperial decrees of A.D. 391 and 396, prohibiting all pagan cults throughout the Roman Empire, the festival simply vanished without the support of a state superstructure. The mysteries weren't entirely underground movements, as often portrayed, and due to their lack of self-sufficiency, most couldn't survive without state subsidy and the confiscation of their funds. Over the course of some 2,000 years, the simple agrarian community festivals of Eleusis underwent radical change. Due to the prohibitions against revealing any physical details concerning the mysteries, tracing historical developments in ritual, theology, liturgy, and so forth is virtually impossible. Sophocles wrote, Thrice happy are those of the mortals who, having seen those rites depart for Hades, for to them alone is it granted to have a true life on the other side. To the rest, all there is, is evil. Statements like these, written by great dramatists, philosophers, and leaders, can be found in abundance throughout the extant texts of the ancient world. When we take the time to imagine the rich monuments at the temples of Eleusis constructed and funded for centuries by governing states, it should be apparent that the mysteries imparted at Eleusis weren't some vapid affair manufactured by a priestly elite in order to fool ignorant peasant farmers. The wisdom passed on at Eleusis contained a novel and beatific perspective. It offered deep spiritual and psychological support which could scarcely be found elsewhere. The mysteries offered the benefit of personal transformation in an era of individualism when mankind no longer needed religion for the purpose of guaranteeing civic order. As men and women thirsted for the exhilaration of the supernatural, the mysteries pushed individuals beyond common superstition by offering a life-transforming union with the goddesses who were apparently responsible for their very source of existence. In an era where inquiries concerning the state of the individual's soul beyond the grave abounded, the initiations at Eleusis unanimously seemed to guarantee both a blessed life on earth as well as in death.